Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the National Conference of State Legislatures webinar, Responding to the Needs of Female Veterans. My name is Jennifer Schultz, and I will be moderating today's webinar, which will address some of the challenges female veterans face when returning to civilian life and the many ways the federal government, states, and communities are working to assist this small but growing population of service members. Before we begin, I want to mention that the webinar is being recorded and everyone will be able to access the recording and presentation slides on NCSL's website. Also available on our website is a new page on state policies for women veterans. Our speakers today are Dr. Betty Mosley-Brown, Acting Director of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs Center for Women Veterans. Anna Baker, manager of the Texas Women Veterans Program, and Stephanie Higgs, care coordinator for Easter Seals Military and Veterans Services in New Hampshire. Please type your questions for our speakers in the question box on the right side of your screen at any time during the webinar. We will hold questions until the end of all presentations. So let's begin. Our first speaker is Dr. Betty Mosley-Brown, Acting Director of the VA Center for Women Veterans, a position she has held since January 2016. In this role, Dr. Mosley-Brown is the primary advisor to the Secretary of Veterans Affairs on programs and issues related to women veterans. Her passion for veterans began with her service in the U.S. Marine Corps from 1978 1992. Her VA career spanning decades began in the Veterans Benefits Administration in San Diego. She held various positions including Veterans Benefits Counselor, Management Analyst in Compensation and Pension Service, and later working for the Associate Deputy Undersecretary for Policy and Program Management in Washington, D.C. Join me in welcoming Dr. Mosley Brown. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. I know that you all may have many questions, and so what I thought I would do is just give you an overview of what VA is doing for women veterans and just give you a little demographic information about our women veterans. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see our aggressive topics that we're going to cover today, and then we'll just jump right in it. So the next slide, please. So it's an honor to be here because, uh, as you heard, I started in the Marine Corps uh, many decades ago, and it was actually 1978, and so much has changed, even from the time when I separated from the military in 1992, and they were just beginning the transition assistance program for separating uh, veterans, separating service members. And to see where it's gotten now, where it's a mandatory class that folks have to sit through um, before they separate or retire, so many changes have happened. And I think it really is impacting our veterans, and especially our women veterans. If you go to the next slide, you'll see an organization chart of the Department of Veteran Affairs. And the Center for Women Veterans is strategically placed in the Office of the Secretary on your screen um, at the top left. And that is so that we can see across VA's administrations, the benefits side, health side, and cemetery side, and really work to fill the gaps for women veterans. So um, it's no secret that we are there. And we work hand in hand with those women veteran program leads that are actually on the ground level making things happen. So I'll tell you more about that shortly. On the next slide, you'll see that we were congressionally mandated in 1994. So the center is just a little over 20 years old. But the Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Service, really they were talking about women in uniform from the time they began in 1951. So we work hand in hand with Dakowitz. Uh, because we realize that it happens very quickly. In fact, it's 24 hours that one day you're in uniform and then the next day you hang up your uniform and you're a veteran. 
Of course, there are those that serve in the Reserve and National Guard who will put their uniforms on um, one weekend a month or two weeks during the summer or be active in the Reserve or Guard. But we're here to help anyone that served or um, are eligible for VA services. Next slide, please. So what do we do? We really monitor and coordinate VA's administration of all the benefits across VA. We are the primary advocate for a cultural transformation uh, within VA and doing events such as this so that we can also educate the general public about services for women veterans. And then finally, it's our job to raise awareness to treat women veterans with dignity and respect. And even though this is 2016, it is important that we still have to say that because many of our women veterans uh, just feel that because their experiences while they were in the military aren't known, they may not get the same uh, respect on par as our male veterans. Next slide, please. So what do women veterans look like? Women veterans look like the young women who are either currently in uniform or may work one weekend a month um, as a reserve or National Guard. Um, our veteran, women veteran population span all the way back to the 1940s whenever um, they signed up in 19, for World War II, but we officially could serve in 1901. And you say, well, that's not a really long time ago. And you're right, but we know that women have been serving as long as there have been uh, skirmishes and wars. Women have disguised themselves to serve. And we even know that at least over 400 women served for the North and the South during the Civil War. So even though we officially couldn't serve till 1901, we know we served before then. And we know that today, if you're in a room with veterans, and there are women seated there that probably, chances are, those women are, are veterans too. You just may not know that they are. They may not have a lanyard on or a hat or a shirt that says that they're a veteran, but they are veterans too. Next slide, please. So let's talk about some of the current day numbers. You can see that we were only about 2% of the overall veteran population in the 1940s. And today, we're about 15% of the active duty ranks and about 18% of the Guard and Reserve. Whereas in the big scheme of things, um, we know that our World War II veterans are passing away in large numbers every day. The total veteran population is decreasing, but we know the overall women veteran population is increasing because of the numbers you see there on the screen. So again, the overall veteran population is decreasing, but our numbers for women are increasing. Next slide. So there are about um, 2 million living women veterans right now, and so that puts us right um, about 9%. But we know that by 2020, we're going to be about 12.4% of the total veteran population. The last bullet is also important because we know that our women veterans are younger than male veterans. Our median age is 49, whereas male veterans are 64. And that's evident when women veterans tell us that when they use a VA facility or go into a regional office, oftentimes they are much younger than the male veterans there. And that's exactly what the research shows us. Next slide. So this shows you the periods of war that women served. You can see that the Gulf War has the highest amount there. But really, right under that is peacetime only. And oftentimes, when we ask veterans when they served, we identify them by the era or what war was going on at that time. But we need to remember that a lot of our veterans also served during peacetime. Next slide, please. So what are some of the challenges that we face? If you go to the next slide, we know that women veterans are often unaware of their veteran status. Uh, for example, my mom was in the Army during the Korea era, and she didn't know that she could come to VA uh, to use services then in the 60s and 70s. 
but a lot changed. And by the end of um, her day, she actually did use VA as her primary care, and now she's actually buried in a Texas um, National Cemetery, or actually she's buried at the Pennsylvania National Cemetery. My dad's down in Texas, but both of them were veterans, and they both um, did use the VA care system, but we know that many of our older women just don't realize that uh, they can come to VA. And you'll see there that we say that women veterans don't often self-identify. What I heard a group of women explain is it's not that they don't, they don't self-identify, it's that no one asks them if they're a woman veteran. So you may want to remember that whenever you are talking to groups uh, that may be veterans. And you can see some of the other challenges that we have there. Um, we just want them to apply for their benefits. We know that sometimes gender-specific care, VA has to purchase it in the community for them, but it is still there. Some have uh, child care options that makes, it, um, unable, makes them unable to come for VA appointments. And there are different things that different communities have tried, uh, like child care options for our veterans. And we just know that just getting to and from appointments can be hard sometimes for our women veterans. Next slide. So how we're addressing that is we're trying to find uh, non-traditional ways to reach our women veterans by uh, social media. In March, we had a Twitter town hall. hall. We are, we're on webinars such as this. Uh, we have, we partnered with um, Veterans of Foreign Wars and American Legion to be on their social media sites. So we look for ways to make sure that our veterans know what information is available to them. We also have at certain VA medical centers, well, in fact, at all VA medical centers, we have women veteran program managers who are there to help women veterans to, to maneuver through the services to, to make sure they're getting the best care anywhere. Next slide, please. And so let's talk a little bit about some health care for women veterans. Next slide. If you look at the news, you'll see that the women veterans coming to VA now are our younger veterans, those that served during Operation Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom. But we also don't want to lose sight that uh, if you look at this chart there, you can see that the age distribution of women veterans who have come in great numbers uh, since fiscal year 01 to fiscal year 10 has been those women almost what we call middle age, and I'm one of them, so age 45 to 65. And we think that that's because women veterans are mothers, daughters, caretakers, and they want to make sure that everyone else's life is taken care of before they actually find out and ask if they're eligible for any benefits. So we know that that's why it's that age frame that we're seeing a large enrollment of women coming to VA. Next slide. And so what are some benefits for women veterans? Next slide. It's actually very easy. If you are a woman veteran, you can sign up for e-benefits. You have 24-7 access to an online program that gets you uh, your home loan certificate if you need it printed out or just to find out the status of your claim. And there's so much information there. So I encourage all veterans, um, especially women veterans, to sign up for e-benefits. Next slide. So what we're trying to do to ensure that uh, veterans uh, are asked if they are a veteran and then to identify is we're currently running the I'm One campaign. And you can download the photo there, the I'm One, I'm a Proud Veteran, on our website, which is www.va.gov. And you can tweet your photo to hashtag Women Vets, and we'll put it up there so we can see what women veterans look like. And I believe I have one last slide that gives our telephone number. If you have any questions, uh, you see our website, our email address is 00W, and our phone number is there. Please contact us, and um, I'll let, now let the next speaker take on. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. That, that was very informative. Um, our next speaker is Anna Baker. She's the manager of the Texas Veterans Commission Women Veterans Program. She served in the Air Force from 1980 to 1984 
as a Korean and Spanish translator and interpreter. Before joining the Texas Veterans Commission, she led sales operations and project management for Dell Inc. and Tech Data Corporation. Helping others achieve success through mentoring and coaching, building business relationships, and serving the needs of customers has been the hallmark of her career. And now she, began, she brings those skills to the Women Veterans Program in order to connect women veterans with the benefits and services they have earned and assist the many organizations helping women veterans in Texas to coalesce around a more holistic approach. Please welcome Anna Baker. Uh, hello, it's great to be here, and it's great to be on the panel. I'm so honored to be on the panel with Dr. Uh, Mosley Brown. Uh, had a pleasure to meet her, and again, just uh, grateful to be here and to let you know what we're doing in Texas to help women veterans. Next slide. Uh, so you can you can go to the next slide. Thanks. So. Talking a little bit about the history of the Texas Women Veterans Program, the Women Veterans Initiative was launched in 2011, and its success has been the foundation for the Women Veterans Program that was created in 2015 by the passage of House Bill 867. Texas has the largest population of women veterans in, in the country, and we currently serve over 180,000 women veterans, and our goal is to help women veterans have equitable access to their federal and state benefits and services. Our program uh, consists of four uh, women veterans themselves dedicated uh, to serving uh, women veterans in the Texas population. Uh, there's myself, the program manager, and three other coordinators, uh, benefit and health care coordinator, an employment coordinator, and an outreach coordinator. Next slide. So our mission isn't to just connect women veterans to benefits, but it's also to empower women veterans to expect equitable treatment, and then to elevate public awareness of the many roles that women have played uh, in our national defense. Our vision is that you know, women veterans will be able to access first-class health care, uh, be housed and educated, uh, thrive in a meaningful career, and establish fulfilling connections within their community and with other women veterans. Uh, to, to do this, uh, one of the things that uh, was created was the Texas Women Veterans Roll Call, which is a touring, a mini touring conference that we're taking around the state. Uh, the first one was held in Houston in, 20, uh, in November of 2015, uh, and we just uh, had one in San Antonio at the, end of the, at the end of March, which was a great success, and I'm actually going to share a few pictures from that event with you uh, here a little later. Uh, our next event is scheduled in Lubbock, and then we'll also have an event in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. El Paso, Harlingen, and uh, end our tour here in Austin uh, in November. So there's four objectives to uh, to our roll call. You know things that we that we feel are important that we want to accomplish at each of these events. And the first is to give women veterans local visibility. Uh, the second is to not just connect the women veterans to their state and federal resources, but also to the resources that are in their own community. Often we fail to, to notice what, what's around us, and so that's the other goal, is to make sure that women know what they have available near them. Uh, connecting local women veterans to one another, we've seen uh, after the last two events, women connecting with each other after the event and establishing relationships and networks. Uh, and then finally, to help identify the needs and experiences through um, various interactions. Uh, we do little surveys and have some focus groups, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as well. Next slide. So, how does the Texas Women Veterans Roll Call answer the requirements put forth by House Bill 867? 
Um, there, there's various requirements, and we've grouped them into four main focus areas, the first one being outreach and information. Uh, and in this, in this category, uh, it's really about, you know, helping the women veterans be aware of everything that's available to them. Um, so we have various uh, uh, claims coordinators, healthcare uh, advisors, and employment coordinators on site uh, able to answer their questions. And then uh, next is to increase public awareness about the gender-specific needs of women veterans. We typically do this with a VA panel. Uh, and then uh, honoring uh, women veterans of the state and women who serve in the military. So the way that we've uh, scheduled our event is the Thursday evening, uh, which is the first day of the event, is a reception or a little uh, gala where we actually uh, invite some legacy women veterans. Uh, the, at the San Antonio event, we had six World War II women veterans there, and we recognize them as well as the rest of the veterans, women veterans that are there. But it's really about promoting um, women, better, women veterans and the, and the contributions that they've made uh, to our country. Uh, the other part of the roll call event is, is really about getting to know uh, the women veterans there and understanding their needs. There's a small little survey that they can choose to do, totally anonymous, that, that is really focused around their transition from military to civilian life. Uh, well, there's a few little focus groups. Uh, and then another thing is voice box. So this, this allows women to provide comments or, or ask questions. They're put in a box, and then they're drawn, and they're kind of used as the starting point for conversations. They're totally anonymous. Uh, women that do provide their, in, their contact information if they have questions, then we get back to them uh, to help connect them uh, in whatever way they need. Uh, then providing assistance. So as part of our little conference, there's uh, training workshops, and, and we have other events that we do throughout the state um, throughout the year as well. And then um, finally, you know, out of all of this uh, come the recommendations that we, that we put before the state on how we continue to, uh, to serve women veterans going forward. Next slide. So here's some of the things we're learning. And I, I think, you know, what you're going to hear, you're going to hear a lot of some of the same themes that came out of Dr. Mosley Brown's uh, presentation. Uh, first, you know, women veterans exhaust all options before they ask for help. You know, we're we're typically very strong, and you know, we if we need help, we'll we'll typically start with our families and friends, and we try to resolve a lot of things on our own before we before we reach out, and and that's part of what we're we're learning. Uh, the second is that we need to, uh, in order to attract women veterans to our event, we have to have a family-friendly atmosphere. And in the last two events, we did have uh, children's activities uh, because we because it is a family thing. Uh, so we definitely encourage that. Uh, we have very strong alliances with the veteran service organizations, and women-centered nonprofits are key. So, so just some of the ones that we've partnered with, uh, the VFW, Comfort Crew, Work Life Institute, Dress for Success, and, and many others who come together to help us make these events a success and to let the women veterans know that they're available to them. Uh, the women veterans who actively participate in the events and outreach are the tip of the iceberg. Uh, women often don't identify as veterans, and we need to increase their visibility. Uh, I was actually one of those women. I did not really identify as a veteran, and since, uh, since becoming a part of the great TBC family here in Texas, uh, I found that there's a lot of other women just like me uh, who, who did not identify as veterans, uh, but definitely see the benefits of being there for their sisters. Um, we must keep working with the VA to assure provision of care for women's health needs. We have a very strong relationship with our 
uh, VA here in Texas, and uh, we are going to continue to uh, work hand-in-hand uh, -hand with them. Uh, women and veterans enjoy an event that's focused on them and their needs, and we've gotten a lot of positive, positive feedback, not just from women, but from um, men and the you know, spouses of uh, women veterans, how much they appreciate uh, an event that's, that, rep, that represents women. And then finally, we're able to support this initial series of events through sponsorships and donations, but appropriation will make the program sustainable. So you know, we, we're very fortunate that we have a very strong uh, veteran support organiza uh, organizations in Texas, people uh, who step up and help make these events possible. And we're grateful for that. Next slide. So what's on the horizon? Um, I mentioned that our next roll call will be in Lubbock, June the 2nd through the 4th, beginning with the Thursday evening gala uh, honoring uh, legacy women veterans. And then Friday and Saturday is really about connecting women veterans to uh, the various resources that we have and make available to them. We have workshops and panels, um, coffee with your congressman. Uh, we, we try to bring in also alternative therapies. Uh, so uh, a large array of different things to, uh, to attract the women veterans to the event and to help them and support them um, on their journey. In addition to and beyond the roll call events, there's, uh, we're developing a strategy to address women veterans' mental health needs in conjunction with uh, Senate Bill 1304, uh, develop a strategy to find and assist rural women veterans, uh, serve as a bridge connecting women veterans to VSOs that serve specific needs, uh, workforce development, skills training, housing, um, alternative therapies and then facilitate an understanding of women veterans and their experiences um, and the history of women veterans through various uh, speakers, bureaus, uh, blogs, PSAs, webcasts, and public relations uh, resources. Next slide. So now I'm just going to, there's just a few pictures here and then the, uh, I will wrap it up. Uh, but this was from the San Antonio event, and this is Congressman Will Hurd addressing um, the uh, legacy veterans and, and all the veterans who were in attendance at the event. Uh, next slide. This is a couple of our women veterans. We gave them you know, yellow roses, and uh, they were very appreciative. They had a great time. Next slide. And this is just a little picture of the of the crowd. So uh, one thing I will say is that you know we've been very fortunate. Uh, the events that we've had and the one coming up in Lubbock, the venues have been very different. In uh, in Houston, we had the opportunity to utilize the NASA Space Center for our venue. In San Antonio, this is the uh, the VFW Post 76 in San Antonio, and it's the oldest post in San Antonio. It's a beautiful old uh, mansion home with a carriage house uh, right on the river walk. So it was, uh, it, it, it was an older venue, but it was it's very historic and, and beautiful. Uh, and you can see everybody was having a good time there. Next slide. Uh, yeah, so uh, Chief Marilyn Cunningham uh, with her uh, entourage of volunteers from uh, the Randolph and Lackland Air Force Base. They, they were uh, escorts for the ladies and uh, just a great picture just to show how the generations of women veterans uh, come together to help each other. And finally, yeah, so we were very fortunate and honored to have some of our Egyptian counterparts, uh, women uh, uh, mil uh, military from Egypt who were uh, doing some training at Lackland Air Force Base and we invited them to our event and they had a, they had a great time. Um, so that's, that's all I have. Thank you again and I look forward to any questions uh, that you may have later. Thank you, Anna. This sounds like a great program.
Let's move on to our final speaker, Stephanie Higgs. Stephanie earned her graduate degree in marriage and family therapy at the University of New Hampshire, and as a mother of a U.S. Marine, determined to focus her career on supporting military families. After working for almost two years in the community mental health setting, she accepted a position as care coordinator at Easter Seals Military and Veteran Services. In this role, she has provided support to over 200 service members, veterans, and their families, assisting them in addressing mental health concerns through counseling, as well as providing direct services related to employment, legal, financial, transportation, and housing issues. Stephanie is also the project manager for the state's Ask the Question initiative, which educates providers in many sectors about the importance of asking, have you or a family member ever served in the military as part of their intake process? In doing so, these providers are able to improve access to and quality of services. Without further delay, we welcome Stephanie. Hi, thank you very much. And I want to say before um, I start with anything that I had planned, I just wanted to thank my co-panelists for their service. Um, and I also wanted to say that I'm encouraged by the fact that some of what I had planned to say um, has already been stated by my co-panelists, and I'm going to go ahead and say those things again anyway because I think they, they bear um, repeating, especially related to ask the question in this project that's near and dear to my heart, um, the fact that they both mentioned that women veterans and veterans in general don't self-identify. And um, so that point will come up again later. But I just wanted to say some of this might be um, repetitive. So thank you for this opportunity to share the work that we do at Easter Seals, New Hampshire Military Veteran Services. Since its inception almost a decade ago, we have served just under 4,400 service members and, their, and veterans. Um, and when we include their family members, whom we also directly support in our program, that number is actually more than 9,000. So we're excited to share our story and our model. Um, I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I do provide, as a care coordinator for Easter Seals, um, direct support to service members, veterans, and their families. And as mentioned, I am the project manager for this Ask the Question campaign um, that I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, but most importantly, I am the mother of a currently serving 23-year-old corporal in the US Marine Corps. And um, so needless to say, I'm passionate in my support of service members, veterans, and their families. In the next 10 to 15 minutes, um, I'm just going to reinforce some of the key messages found in Easter Seals' call to action policy paper, which holds up our care coordination work at Easter Seals, New Hampshire, as a model for local community-based access to reintegration support for women veterans. The call to action paper highlights the need for immediate action to close the gap in care and services for female veterans in need of support. Next slide, please. So Easter Seals is almost 100 years old. We've been in the game for a long time. Um, we are a nonprofit, and we have a nationwide model for local community-based supports and services to address all kinds of needs. I didn't know until I applied for this job that Easter Seals had military and veteran services. I thought they were an agency focused solely on um, helping disabled children and their families. So it was a pleasant surprise to me that um, an organization such as Easter Seals had this work and that I could be a part of it. Um, we identified the need to provide services to our military after World War II, and we've continued to do so since then. Our military and veterans uh, functions um, in partnership with several other Easter Seal services, including children's services, workforce development, and senior services, so that we can ensure wraparound care for our female veteran clients. Um, New Hampshire had an incredible opportunity around a decade ago um, where Easter Seal's military and veteran service was asked to collaborate with the New Hampshire National Guard and the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services to figure out the best way to support soldiers and their families who, for the first time in New Hampshire, were deploying in large numbers. Our service delivery model um, was proactive and confidential uh, care coordination, and it works. Um, over the years, our underlying model has remained consistent. We, care co we provide care coordination uh, in all that that title implies aligning community-based services and supports that provide a hand up and not a hand out, real key distinction we make in providing services. 
Um, and New Hampshire is a real interesting state because we don't have, unlike Texas, <laughs> we don't have any active duty bases, yet we have um, the eighth largest per capita population of veterans in the country. We have 115,000 veterans. And um, that doesn't include those who are currently serving or their families. Um, so we have a team of eight full-time care coordinators who provide these direct services, and they each carry a caseload of around 30 cases at any time um, that are very active cases. So if that's the our, our client population here in New Hampshire, I can only imagine the number of female veterans who are in need in larger states. Um, so we provide services um, to service members, veterans, and their families. Um, and adding the families into our picture is kind of a unique feature. Um, but we provide services to clients of all service eras. Um, we have World War II nurses as our clients. Um, and we have women who currently lead transportation units in Afghanistan as our clients. Um, as mentioned earlier, the, vet, the female veteran population is constantly increasing. We expect to add around 200,000 women veterans across the country in the next four to five years, and they'll be joining that two million figure that was mentioned earlier. So the time is now um, to address their needs. Uh, next slide, please. Easter Seals knows that community um, is the point of greatest impact and that the solution to reintegration support has to be community-based because the issues and needs that female veterans face often surface years after their service ends. We find this all the time where we engage with new clients who have not served for a decade or more and yet issues related to their service are surfacing now. Um, and obviously it's at a point where federal and other state programs have ended. Um, so the community is always there. The New Hampshire Care Coordination Model assists female veterans in navigating some of the old um, barriers that, that everyone's aware of to accessing care. We integrate the VA and community partnerships, and we really help veterans bust through the silos so that they can receive optimal coordinated care. Uh, we collaborate every day with local agencies and organizations to make sure that our clients' needs are met. met. Um, we have our hands in lots of pots um, addressing the needs of our female veterans. We have care coordinators serving on a justice-involved veteran committee um, shared with the VA and local court. Um, and they support veterans in the court system where a veterans track, kind of like a drug court drug track, um, exists and provides alternative sentencing in the form of treatment um, for our justice-involved veterans at the VA. Um, we also have a care coordinator serving as a liaison with Easter Seals Substance Use Disorders Treatment Center, where we can expedite admission for service members and veterans. Um, we have a care coordinator working with the VA's Veteran Incentive Program, or VIP, um, <laughs> where we can expedite admission. Um, I mean, I'm sorry. For VIP, it's about um, providing funding for in-home care for our clients so they can stay in their homes instead of um, needing to go to nursing homes. And we also manage three different housing programs where we closely collaborate with local shelters, um, our town and city housing authorities, and landlords um, to ensure that our clients have stable housing. So um, it's really important to know that our work is only possible through a combination of public and private funding and a real strong partnership. Um, Veterans Count is a philanthropic arm of our operation of Easter Seals Military and Veteran Services, and they have shown unparalleled, unbelievable commitment. Um, they've raised over $1 million last year alone and millions over the past decade. And we use that money every single day to support our female veterans. Last month alone, we provided um, $1,500 uh, $5, um, in emergency assistance. Um, and we do it by spending $0.90 cents on the dollar in direct financial assistance. So it's really critical that we need to corral government programs and funding with society's generous um, philanthropic spirit to blend private and public funding. Um, we are constantly looking for and pursuing other grants and funding so to sustain our care coordination services, um, but there's just every day a growing need, as mentioned earlier. Um, I wanted to share just a little bit about Ask the Question. 
it is garnering some national attention. It's such a simple concept um, about exploring and inquiring about a person's military experience when they come in for needs. So whether they go into a welfare department as a homeless person or um, you know, they need help getting a job, they go into New Hampshire Employment Security, whatever it may be, um, this initiative is about asking about military service. So it's a state-funded program through the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. We were awarded this grant in a competitive bid because of our stellar reputation um, of positive outcomes with our veterans. It's an outreach and awareness campaign, um, and it, encur it encourages civilian service providers to ask about military service, something they're not comfortable talking about typically, um, when people come in. And they, the basic question is, have you or a family member ever served in the military? So this campaign dovetails beautifully with our care coordination work um, and helps to identify veterans in needs because obviously when the question is asked, the answer can be yes, and then what do you do? So there's a linkage there between services like our care coordination model and this campaign. Um, this campaign has emphasized over the past year of, its, um, of the work that we've been doing the critical nature of engaging and informing community services to supplement and complement the VA. We know that no one agency or organization can do it all. We also know that there's lots of veterans who aren't eligible for VA services for lots of different reasons. So um, it's really a, it's a, it's a both type concept, not an us versus them. So thank you for any New Hampshire state leaders who are on this call um, for your support of this campaign. Um, next slide, please. So in our work with the New Hampshire National Guard, um, we learned some things early on that has informed our model then, um, that trust is everything, that dignity and respect are everything, that our veteran clients hate red tape, uh, that their financial needs can't often be met through existing government resources that they don't like asking for help, what that's been mentioned before, um, but that when they do, they'll most often present with a financial need, and they will rarely ask for help for their emotional needs. So our model puts no restrictions on our services. We engage with our women veterans over whatever their express need is, um, and we gain trust and entree into their lives. Um, we meet her where she lives and where she lives. So. Um, our care coordination model has a very, takes a very holistic view of our female veterans. We address not only the presented need, but we do a comprehensive assessment of all the challenges, and we work hard um, to form trusting relationships to get at what else is going on and help address those needs, whether it be employment, housing, um, or mental health, or, or other needs. Um, female veterans, as mentioned before, face very unique challenges. 84% of them are of working age, as opposed to the male veterans who I think in Dr. Mosley Brown's slide, I think it was um, the average age was 64 or something. That's not the case for female veterans. They still need employment. Um, so they, they face very high unemployment rates in part due to the difficulty they have in translating their military experience into civilian language. Um, they are the fastest growing segment of the homeless vet population. Um, so the, the connection here is holistic. Um, they often have the custody of their kids, and the lack of affordable child care is the highest unmet need for these women. Others, other factors might be um, untreated PTSD and military sexual trauma. And then to top it off, a lot of the homeless shelters aren't family shelters. Um, so unfortunately, um, women veterans commit suicide at a rate six times higher uh, than women who haven't served, and they're at a much greater risk for depression than their male veteran counterparts. And interestingly, they are less likely to seek mental health services than their male counterparts who have served. And I think that was mentioned in the slide earlier, too, and part of the, part of the reasoning for that is that women reach out to their support networks and their family and such first, and they're much less likely to seek help um, through the VA. Um, they also have much higher divorce rates than their civilian counterparts. So there's a whole um, plethora of issues that impact the needs of our female veterans. Um, the care coordination model is individualized, um, providing direct services um, by well-informed and clinically trained case managers. So our team of eight are all clinically trained, um, and they can provide therapeutic support. 
um, but also do a ton of case management around the issues that I just spoke of. Um, we, on a daily basis, leverage our collaborative partnerships with our local resources and services to meet the needs of our female veterans. And we develop holistic care plans to identify and address these needs through both long and short-term supports and services um, to fill the gaps in their care. Um, the emergency financial assistance that we provide through Veterans Count is a unique feature of our program as well and enables us to address things such as unpaid utility bills when there's a risk of a shutoff, um, getting car repairs done so that a mom can get to work and to school. Um, all we create um, care plans for all of our clients whose focus is self-sufficiency, again, always with the concept of a hand up and not a handout. Um, so as I mentioned a minute ago, we know that issues and needs arising from military service can surface years later. Um, and so it's critical for us not to just address the immediate presenting problems, to also assess and address all the contributing factors to address the root issues um, so that we can prevent recurrences of need in the future. Next slide, please. In this current era, we are experiencing tremendous support for our troops overall, and it's, it's a nice thing. But our, but our worry is, sincerely, every day, we worry at what point you know, will our country's focus shift, and will its interest in helping our vets wane? If and when this happens, the community is always there. But there is a need for a glue within the community to connect the dots and to ensure that there's a local network of support and services that will exist after a woman veteran service ends. Um, we recommend the creation of funding opportunities for community organizations to replicate the care coordination model. And we encourage you all um, listening today to challenge your local providers to come up with a way to develop local philanthropic match. Because the outcomes, whether it be linking a female veteran to health care or to a job or to ensure stable housing, those outcomes are significant. And they work only with a private-public partnership. Um, I wanted to share just a few quick statistics about um, the, some of the um, markers that we have achieved in the, over the past decade in the New Hampshire Military Veteran Services. We have provided, um, in a little less than 10 years, um, over $2.5 million in emergency financial assistance to our clients. We've helped over 800 veterans find jobs. We've prevented homelessness in 830 cases. And we've secured housing for 600 veterans who were literally homeless. We've also, very importantly, intervened and helped prevent over 100 suicides by responding immediately um, to our clients who trust us. Um, and lastly, and really important for this conversation, is that we have provided over 8,500 warm handoff referrals to the community resources, veteran resources, um, and to the VA. Um, so there's a need for local um, care coordination that can assist female veterans in accessing and navigating the often disjointed um, services that exist. Female veterans need help um, from programs such as ours that can help coordinate and consolidate resources and service delivery and get rid of the red tape. There is a need to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of accessing help and identifying needs, um, really to create a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. So prioritizing veterans in existing programs is easy and powerful. And it improves local coordination of services and collaboration um, and really operationalizes. I'm not sure if this is a term outside of New Hampshire, but we've got this no wrong door concept. And, it, and this, this collaboration really operationalizes this no wrong door concept of ac accessing care. Next slide, please. So in closing, um, female veterans, uh, we believe, can really thrive when they transition back into the community, especially if the communities are prepared and coordinated to respond to their needs. I thank you so much for your time. Um, you can find sample legislation and recommendations in Easter Seals Call to Action policy paper. Um, but please don't hesitate to call me or Maynard Freeze if you have questions or if you want to find out more about the um, New Hampshire care coordination model. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. 
Uh, we will now move into the question and answer portion of the webinar. If you have a question for one or all of our speakers, please type it in the box on the right. Um, we do have a few to get going. Um, so our first question is intended for um, all of our speakers. How do you advertise events for women veterans and reach those who might not have taken advantage of uh, benefits and services previously? This is Betty. I can start that. Um, we look for non-traditional ways to get the information out uh, from radio to print because we know that while we post things on our main VA website, it really has to drill down to the local area facilities to see what's going on and how and what events are happening. So we look for all kinds of ways to advertise. But the main VA website and uh, just trying to get information out that way is the best way that we know of right now. But we look for other ways, such as social media. We've been using social media as well. This is Stephanie. Um, we are partnering with the Ask the Question campaign um, with an organization called Dear Mighty Things, and they're doing a lot of military culture training for civilian service providers in the state. And social media has been key to reaching that um, civilian provider population. This is Anna. This just to just to kind of add to that, we we are also utilizing social media, uh, and we have a communications team that we are working with uh, currently to really look at the population of women veterans that we have in Texas because Texas is so expansive to make sure that we are targeting the right channel of communication uh, to those areas. Uh, based on the number of uh, veterans in that area as well as uh, the, the means of communication that are available to them. So you, we also use our website, but you know, we also partner with a lot of our, uh, when we have our events, like with the VFW when we were in San Antonio, with the, the Veteran County Service Organization to get that information out there. This question is perhaps intended for everyone as well. What funding streams are associated with these programs? Well, this is Betty. You know, we are funded by uh, Congress and the federal government, so it's a little bit different. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't think that the question really can be answered like the others can answer. So uh, we're the federal government. So I'll let the others go. <laughs> so this is Anna. Currently, our program is is not funded, uh, even though it was uh, created out of House Bill 867. Uh, so we, um, you know, one of our goals is to to meet the requirements of the House Bill and put forward um, you know, a recommendation for appropriation. But we, like I said, you know, we've been very, very fortunate that we have such a huge uh, level of support within the state of Texas for veterans. And, and uh, all of our uh, partners, uh, just people in the local community, uh, our legislative uh, representatives have all come forward uh, some of the employers have come forward with uh, donations to help support our events, uh, corporate sponsors. And I'll just um, quickly repeat what I had said earlier about our program being supported through a combination of private and public funding. So we do receive um, some funding through grants through the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. Um, we also have, as I mentioned, this very strong philanthropic arm um, of Easter Seals called Veterans Count that supports a lot of the work that we do. Um, so. 
Thank you. Another question, this one is for Stephanie. Can you give us an example of how the Easter Seals model is connecting veterans to existing community resources, whether they're available through the VA, state, or other local programs? Sure. Um, <laughs> I could think of a million, but um, I can't, in fact, I can't think of a case um, where we would be working with any of our clients where we wouldn't connect them to resources. But specifically, um, we have cases where people come in, um, they might initially call and say, um, could you help me uh, with my utility bill? And so we would work with the town welfare department um, to see what assistance the town might be able to provide. Um, any unmet need um, remaining after that, we could use our Veterans Count Fund for. Um, but we work with the town welfare departments all the time. We work with housing authorities and local shelters all the time. We might have a homeless client who um, we can get into a veteran-specific housing program, but there's going to be a little bit of a delay in that for lots of different reasons. Um, so we work closely with shelters to make sure that people have a roof over their head while they're waiting for more permanent housing. Um, we work with uh, local food banks all the time and um, get, making sure that people are signed up for um, food stamps. Um, we work with the community mental health centers a lot also, as I mentioned earlier, you know, most of our veterans um, aren't eligible for VA services and um, or if they're not a combat veteran, aren't able to access therapeutic support through the local veteran center. So we have strong partnerships with the community mental health centers to get our veterans connected there for um, therapy and support. I could go on and on and on. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. Um, we have time for just a couple more. Um, Anna, do you have any advice for state legislators or others interested in starting a women veterans program in their state? Maybe any challenges you've dealt with? Uh, yeah, so um, I'm, I, let me see if I can answer that. You know, I'm fairly new to the program. I've, I've been with the program since February. Um, the initiative that was started in 2011 uh, was really one woman who um, kind of got, uh, got things rolling. Uh, I, I think the one thing that probably that we have that, uh, is critical to the, su the success uh, and the sustainability of a women veterans program is support from your executive leadership and that's one thing that uh, that we do have so we have um, our executive uh, director is always promoting the women veterans program at the events that he has and talking up the program uh, and so that is helpful um, of course, our challenge uh, our challenge is is money, and uh, that's something that that we're working on. Um, but I, you know, still being relatively new, I I have had mostly, you know, positive uh, support uh, from the agency, the Texas Veteran Commission, as well as you know a lot of the other agencies that we work with. Uh, to have a program that's specific to women veterans. I, I don't know if that answered the question very well, but um, that's what I have. <laughs> I think it does. Thank you for that. Uh, one final question. Betty, uh, can you provide some examples of the VA's collaboration with states? Absolutely. Um, in fact, I was just in Arizona where they were uh, finishing up their uh, Women Veterans Summit. They had four at different cities, and we were in Flagstaff over the weekend. And, um, you know, the rural women veterans there were so appreciative that an event for them was happening, and it took place at a university site, and it was all collaboration. It was VA. It was um, the state of Arizona, uh, the service officers, um, 
healthcare, education. I mean, it was so well attended and people were there just to provide resources to the veterans and their families. So that's just one example, but I can tell you that um, each state has a, some kind of Department of Veteran Affairs or Veterans Commission or some veterans group, and they all try to reach back to VA somewhere uh, to get that collaboration going, as well as non-government organizations where we're forming uh, strategic partnerships. Today just formed a partnership at the Women's Memorial with Academy Women and their e-mentor program. So great things are happening through collaboration. All right, well that's all the time we have for today. Again, I'd like to thank our speakers for participating in the webinar and sharing uh, this valuable information with our audience. And thanks to attendees for listening and offering your questions. As a reminder, you will receive an email shortly about how to access the recording and slides from today that you can share with others. All right, thank you.